weight and the gravity of my apples. If I really want to get deep and large and textural with my shadows, this is a great way to go. So I start there and I just start kind of mapping out broad areas of light and shadow. Um, that's really important. You want to ground your objects and you want to make them begin to take on a three dimensional form early on. That's not something you want to leave for later because it's very hard to make convincing shapes um, half an hour into just doing like very careful contour lines. Contour lines are the outlines of all of your objects. Um, and we'll talk about variety of line in a moment when we get into that, because that's important as well. It's all important. Just put a star next to all of it. Um, so let me put in my cast shadow here. Oops. And you'll drop charcoal a lot and it will break and you just have to make peace with it because that's what charcoal is. You'll also be incredibly messy. So you have to make peace with that as well. I have students who are like complete control neat freaks. Um, and I just say you have to abandon that whenever you work in charcoal because it's just a hot mess all the time. Um, so as I start to make sense out of this composition, I start identifying where my darkest darks are. Um, and so for me, since I don't have a black object in my composition per se, um, I have to look and see where my deepest shadows are because my shadows are gonna be the darkest portion. I've put this all down on a dark green cloth as you can see in the photos. Um, so I have to use that as my darkest area. Now you can up the contrast, you can make the aesthetic choice to say, I know these aren't pure blacks, but I'm gonna make them deep pure blacks for the sake of high contrast. I would just say, if you wanna do that kind of like how I'm doing, just tread lightly because it is, even though charcoal is a forgiving medium and you can pull things out with erasers, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, sometimes there is like a point of no return to some extent. So just make sure that if you're doing dark blacks, just don't go like, don't go crazy. Don't press in really hard. Don't do it with your content crayon this early in this, in this game. Um, so I'm just gonna continue to put in my shadows here, continue to sort of shape my apples and figure out where the lights and shadows are and where those fall. Now, you may get to a point where you're like, okay, I'm drawing a bunch of dark shadows. This is all just starting to recede into charcoal oblivion. That's where you take your kneaded eraser. You can also use a vinyl eraser, but I just really like these. Um, these, or, I'm sorry, not your kneaded eraser. I misspoke. Your art gum eraser. Um, I like these because they're really chunky and they kind of paint with a broad brush as it were and you can really take out like a lot at a time. This isn't necessarily for precision work, but this is good in the early stages. So just like I identified my areas of darkest shadow or began to do that, I'm gonna start identifying my lightest lights. So very clearly we have a white vase, right? Part of it's in shadow, but it is a very bright white object. So I just take my eraser and I draw it reductively. Um, I try to get people to abandon the notion of thinking of the eraser as a corrective tool. It is a drawing tool as much as your charcoal, your conte, your willow, all of those things are. So you're drawing with your eraser. So I'm still looking at my vase, I'm looking at my subject matter and I'm just erasing out. And look, I'm suddenly left-handed. Um, I'm just erasing out the brightest white part. And so it's gonna be the left side of the vase for me where the light is falling. And then here, I'm just gonna like leave the midtone for now because I'm liking that drama in the, um, in the contrast, but you can certainly go back in and lighten it up more. Um, sometimes I like to erase out my entire white object and then start bringing shadows back in. So you'll find that with charcoal, it's a lot of just calibrating and moving forward and moving back and bringing things in and bringing things back out. Um, just adding charcoal, then erasing, then adding charcoal, then smudging, then erasing. So um, don't be afraid of that. There's nothing wrong with just continuing to calibrate and redo things. So I'm also going to to start looking at the light green portions of the skin on my um, on my apples because it is lighter than the midtone. If you look at the midtone as being this, like you want to think about the shadow of the vase as being a similar value to where a lot of the green areas on the apple skins are. So I'm going to start kind of erasing that out as well. And as you do that, um, try to think about it sculpturally. Think about shaping and sculpting the apple in three dimensions, um, even though you're only working in two. And the more you think about your objects as being these three-dimensional objects, uh, the more believable your drawing will be. And that's one of the reasons that I tell people as much as humanly possible, like I know that there are limitations and we all use reference photographs, but as much as humanly possible, if you can even just 
practice drawing from life, whether it's people or animals or still life or a coat hanging up in the hallway, like all of these things, you will get so much more information from real life because you can step up to an object, you can walk around it, you can, you know, touch it, feel it, you can move the, the lighting and change the angle. And photographs, with all due respect to photographers and the art of photography, photographs are always going to lie to you. It's a camera's eye, it's not a human eye, and it's not, um, your proportions are never going to be as perfect as when you're seeing it and looking at it in real life and feeling that, that depth firsthand. Um, so again, no shade to photographers because I respect photography as an art, but just in the context of drawing something accurate, um, it's not a great idea to work only from a photograph. Um, oftentimes what I will do, especially when I do like portraits, is whenever possible, I have someone sit for me from life. I do about 70 to 80% of the image with them sitting there. And when I feel like they're tapping out, I take a photograph of them and I do my final touches from the photograph. But that way it retains the initial life and the energy of um, that person. And you have a lot of movement because we've all seen and we've all done work from photographs and you can tell the difference between a work that's been done from a photograph and a work that's been done from life. And again, I hope I'm not offending anyone or ruffling any feathers from by saying that. I'm just like, just suggesting kindly that you draw from life as much as humanly possible. Um, it will make you a better artist. So when you are resorting to just working from a photograph, for example, if you have a commission or something and someone sends you a photo, your drawing will be more lifelike. It, you can make it look much less like a photograph if you have the experience drawing from life. Even if it's just your coffee, coffee cup in the morning or something totally mundane, just drawing a few minutes every day is just so, so good for your practice. Um, just like with anything, if you wanna learn a new language, you've gotta practice it every day, you've gotta immerse yourself in it. And with drawing, if you wanna build up your skill, you've gotta do it all the time. Um, I teach all the time and I don't always get time to make my own work and I can feel the difference. I can feel my work suffer if I haven't had a month or two at a time to work on something on my own from start to finish. So. As you can see, I'm just continuing to draw reductively with my eraser. And don't be afraid to smudge. Your hand is like your best tool. It's always there. We've been doing it since cave painting times. Just smudge if you want to smudge. If you are very neat and you don't like your hands to look like this by the end of a drawing, then use a paper towel, use a rag, use a cotillion. You can use like a paper that's wrapped really tight in the shape of a pencil. Um, you can make your own, you can buy one. I use my, my hands all the time in my work. Um, it's just the quickest way for me to smudge. Now, there's two different ways to create um, your shadows and your definitions. If you are a more smudgy sculptural person, if you like to hide the evidence of your line, you can go ahead and you can do what I'm doing here. You can smudge throughout. You can get yourself to an almost photorealistic photo level of drawing. Um, you can also use hatching or cross hatching, quick crash course. Hatching is simply creating a series of lines parallel to each other. Um, hang on. So hatching, literally that. Hatching can be this, it can be tight, it can be very loose and messy like this. You can do a series of zigzags, that's hatching. Cross hatching, literally what it sounds like. You can cross the hatch with another hatch. This is cross hatching. This is cross hatching. So hatching, cross hatching does not necessarily mean flat lines. And in many cases, I don't even recommend that. So for example, with an apple, if you do want to use hatching and cross hatching, let's say in this main apple right here, let me just throw that stem in there so I see where I am. Um, you don't want to go flat. The reason you don't want to go flat is because it's going to look like you pasted a grid on top of it and it's going to be one flat apple. It's just totally going to flatten itself out. So you wanna work with the contours of the apple. Pretend that you're taking a Sharpie and you're going from the inside, the little pit of that stem and you're drawing a Sharpie going all the way down to the bottom of that apple. So that is going to support the three-dimensionality of the apple rather than obliterating it and flattening the whole thing out. So you can use contour lines like this you can use cross contour lines, which is essentially the same kind of idea as hatching. You're going across the contour. So it's like taking a string and tying it around an apple. In all my demonstrations and analogies, I love to just destroy fruit with strings and <laughs> sharpies, but it's a good way to think about it. Um, 
And you do want to consider a variety of line as you go. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, one solid line that doesn't have any variety is going to be something like that. And if you treat all of your outlines like that, all of your contours, you are going to, in effect, flatten everything out. It's going to look like a sticker. So in real life, nothing is made up of lines, right? We just, we're trained to draw in a linear fashion. So we think about things in terms of lines. We've got to define, we've got to make a line around every single little object in our drawing. Um, but really, that's not how you want to go about it. Lines can start really deep and really dark where an object is sitting on the surface and then it can disappear into maybe almost nothing as the light hits it. Maybe a line gets smudged out. Maybe a line stops being drawn and starts back up right here. So that's variety of line. Um, how do you achieve variety of line? Just careful observation. I always say the 50-50 rule. 50% 50 of the time your eyes should be on your subject, which means 50% of the time they're on your paper and no more than that. If you can, if you can achieve a 70-30 where 70% of the time you're looking at your subject and only 30% of the time you're on, on your paper, you will have an even better drawing. Um, it's all about just honing your hand-eye coordination, but the more you're looking at your subject, the more accurate your drawing is going to be. Um, I think we all have a tendency to draw what we think we know versus um, what we're actually seeing. And so that's the trick, isn't it? Is to put away your arrogance and your empirical knowledge of what an apple looks like and say, okay, but what does this exact apple in this exact lighting in this exact angle look like? And the more you kind of give in, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I'm getting charcoal in my throat. Um, the more humble you are about, about what you actually think you know things look like, the more accurate your drawing is going to look like because you're gonna spend more time actually observing your subject. So I did forget to mention that I, I switched over to, to Conti Crayon uh, when I started getting things more precise. So especially if you like to work linear, if you love having evidence of line and hatching and cross hatching and texture, more power to you. I love a big textural, messy layered drawing. You want to have your, your line work in there, absolutely put it in there. Like nothing's stopping you. That's not going to make your image less realistic. Just continue to carefully observe. So if you want to um, develop a shadow and you want the linear evidence of you developing that shadow, by all means, you can still achieve a three-dimensional, accurate, well-observed drawing by having lots of evidence of line. So just continue to go through, smudge where you wanna smudge, leave the lines open where you wanna leave the lines open. This is gonna be a frustrating thing that crops up a lot when you work in charcoal is you'll white something out and then you'll get your fingerprints all over it and then you'll have to white it out again, but that's no big deal. It's all part of the fun. It's like when you're in ceramics and you, I don't know, you mush the side of your, of your pot because you got too thin on the wheel, which is something I never, <laughs> never been able to master throwing things on the wheel. Um, so this in a lot in a lot of ways is a lot more forgiving. You're not going to mush your entire base down and have to start completely over. You just keep erasing and adding and erasing and adding. Um, so yeah, so what happens if you do put this thick line in here and it's flattened out your whole image? Okay, so then you start to carefully observe what does the drapery behind this object look like? So for me, I'm gonna switch over to this mid-size. For me, there's a nice little shadow in the fold of the drape right here toward the upper part of the vase. And then down here, it gets a little bit lighter. And then there's an area of light before this sharp cast shadow comes through. So really the only part of the line I wanna to try to obliterate or reduce is this one right here. And so you can just erase really hard. You'll get a big white mark. You can smudge it down with your dirty fingers. See how that comes back into play? You can keep using your hands. And then if you want to, or if you need to, bring back a little bit of that line, but remember to use variety of line. Remember to use a softer hand. And see how immediately, it's by no means a perfect finished base, but immediately that side begins to gain three dimensions. Um, so as we're talking about shadows and negative space bumping up right up against positive space and objects in the foreground, um, remember not to leave little spaces between your objects where there aren't any. By that I mean, if you're working on a cast shadow, let's say under this apple here, um, in the fold of the fabric, there's this like nice deep cast shadow. Get right up to the edge of that apple. 
Um, sometimes people have this tendency to leave like little halos of space. They bring their cast shadow right up and then there's like a quarter or an eighth inch there between the cast shadow and the object that's being cast or that's casting it. Um, and that kind of ruins the illusion of, of real life. So again, with shadows and with negative space as much as positive space, careful observation and watching, um, looking at that. Uh, and a material, sorry, itchy eye. Charcoal is a very itchy process. Um, <laughs> And I, okay, I thought I, I thought I just got charcoal over my face. No, we're fine. Um, so this is something I really like. This is uh, a mechanical eraser. Works exactly like a mechanical pencil, but just eraser comes out when you press it. This is a really, really nice drawing tool. And it's a really great way to internalize that notion of the fact that an eraser is just reductive drawing. It's not correcting. Um, so you can use this. And I love to use this because for example, with this apple that I'm working on here, on the left side, right, above the cat's shadow, there's like this very beautiful light area. And you can just go in with your mechanical eraser, draw that in, draw in that little patch of white. And that way you can get a really nice, precise little fine line without having to mess with like a big fat blunt eraser and try to get in there. You can also do things like this with your kneaded eraser. The kneaded eraser is that gray blue one that you can stretch out and pull and twist. And the benefit of that is you can shape it into a skinny little shape. You can flatten it out and pick up just thin layers of charcoal so you're not completely erasing something out. Um, so there's different tools for every job. Um, I always like to have at least two different kinds of erasers on hand when I draw. I don't use the kneaded eraser as much, but um, I think when I use, when I do like uh, nude studies, um, when I do anatomy, that's always really nice. The, the kneaded eraser is really good to capture like the nuances of skin and things like that, um, shadows and lights on skin. But for still lives, I love to have a mechanical eraser. I love to have this big fat eraser. <laughs> Um, and then another thing I wanted to mention is uh, using that negative space to figure out proportions. Um, so for example, if you're concerned about um, the relationship of like this apple to this apple, is it too close? Is it too far away? Instead of looking at that positive space and trying to guess at it, look at the negative space. Take, an, take like a, in your mind's eye, pretend that you're, that you're drawing a line around this apple, around this apple, and then pay very close attention to the drapery that's happening right here underneath this apple. So there's like a sharp white light right here in the drapery. And then right about next to that is where that apple will start. So for me, as I begin to observe the negative space, I realized it's this apple, I drew it way too close. So the lovely thing about charcoal is that I can just erase it out with my finger and bring it down a little further. Um, and I'll do that with my Conte crayon now. Just, and keeping the lines light so that I don't turn this like big black outline or that I don't create this big black outline. I'm just bringing that in. And again, just paying attention to what that negative space is doing around this apple. Is it all one dark point of gray or is there more folding in the drapery? And drapery is a, is a, um, a heroically difficult thing to draw. I only really broach it in a serious respect in my drawing two class. Um, but even if you don't really know, quote unquote, how to draw a drapery, it really is just about very careful observation. Where do I have areas of light? Where do I have areas of shadow? Do not freak out about the fact that you're trying to draw this amorphous piece of fabric. Just focus on the lights and shadows and the rest of it will come. And at the end of the day, when you have a still life like this, and even if you just leave things as like rough little outlines, that still creates the idea of, of drapery and your viewer's eye is going to fill in the rest of that. So don't worry too much. Um, what I try to go for, and I'll say this as respectfully as possible because I'm just not a fan of photorealism, but when I teach, I'm not going for photorealism. I want it to look like a drawing. I want people to see the texture and, and the work that's put into it. Um, I don't want to use the same amount of emphasis on every single square inch of this drawing. I don't want it to be, to be confused with photograph. Like for me, the art is in the fact that I've drawn it. Um, so, so it's okay if, if some things remain a little bit expressive or a little bit stylized or a little bit unfinished. 
Um, and there's something my professor at CMU used to tell me all the time. She's a brilliant woman, Mary Widener. I adore her. And every time I teach a drawing class, I hear her voice in my head, like no joke. Every single time I teach, I think about her. Um, but she always talked about selective emphasis. So when you get your drawing to a certain stage, let's say I have everything to a level of finish, but I have this apple. Then I start to make that decision for my viewer. What's the most important thing in my composition? What do I want my viewer to focus on? Um, and so do I want it to be this apple in the foreground? Do I want to spend a lot of time and have the viewer's eye continue to come back to that foreground over and over again, and look just at this apple? Do I want my viewer to look at the, the subtle details in the milk glass? And so do I want to go in there and do all those little lights and shadows and all that relief um, that's on the bottom of the vase. It's, it's up to you. Um, and so by manipulating your composition with uh, figuring out where everything's going to go, by setting up your still life, if you're in control of that, by using active emphasis to get certain objects to a certain level of finish, all of these things are a way for you to control what you want your viewer to focus on and care about. So um, I think that that's that's an important thing because I think people, when they first start out drawing, they want to treat everything with the same level of emphasis. And I think part of the art and the like, the artistic vision lies in figuring out what's important and what you want your viewer to think is important. So um, at the risk of running over an hour, because I do not have a clock in front of me anywhere, um, let me know where I'm at. And I certainly want to open the floor for lots of questions. So if, if there's many, if there's none, doesn't matter. Go ahead. You're fine. We're only at about eight o'clock right now. Okay, so great. You've been going so for early. About half an hour. Fantastic. Yep. All right. Yep. Well, if anyone does have questions now or at any point as I'm continuing to speak and work, please just interrupt me and shout out whatever you have questions about, and I can certainly continue to, to answer. Is that just regular drawing paper, Olga? It is. Yeah. You know what? It's actually, I, <laughs> this is probably against the rules, but I really like using vellum paper. Um, I, even though I love a textural drawing, I hate texture and tooth on my paper when I work. Um, and just like, it's always rubbed me the wrong way. And so I buy a uh, Bristol vellum paper, which is very, very, very smooth. Um, but Certainly, whenever COVID restrictions lift and it's a little bit easier to make it to the art store, I always recommend that people take a trip and touch a bunch of paper and figure out what feels right for you. But for me, in this case, it's just Bristol vellum. These are about roughly a dollar a sheet, um, 18 by 24. Because it looks like it erases really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I love about it. When you have a toothy paper, something with a a lot of texture on it it's it everything kind of gets stuck inside of those little crevices mm -hmm. um and then it's kind of hard to really control the level of smoothness so i always i always say if you really don't like texture um then that's a really good way to go thank you yeah so if no one has questions at this moment i feel like i I inundate people with with information. It's kind of like when you go on an interview and they tell you everything and they're like, do you have any questions? And you really want to appear intelligent and have a great question, but you're just like, I don't, I, you, um, when, how much vacation do I get? I don't know. <laughs> so I feel like I do kind of the same thing when I give demonstrations that people are like, kind of gobsmacked that they have all this info in their heads and it's probably not even all going to stick after one session. Um, just because that's not how a human brain is built, but my brain is built to just give people everything. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, if there's no questions, that's okay. Uh, but again, you can interrupt at, at any point at all. Um, but yeah, I just continue, as, as you've noticed, I, I just continue to kind of work around the page. Like I've spent a lot of time on this apple here front and center. I wanna make sure that I give at this point the same amount of work um, to every single object because I haven't hit my stage of selective emphasis just yet. I want to make sure that that I'm continuing to move around the page. Um, and another thing that I always tell students when I have them in class, um, you know, we'll take a break halfway through usually because your brain does hit a point of visual saturation. Um, and just what I mean by that is that you stop being able to see what you're doing. You just lose sight of it. Um, you're totally in front of you and what you're working on. Um, and it's very, very important to stand up, excuse me, and walk away from your drawing for five minutes, 10 minutes, a day, if you have a day to, to spare, 
But in class, I always say, just walk away from your drawing for about 10 minutes, take a bathroom break, smoke a cigarette, whatever it is that you like to do, uh, make a phone call and come back. And when you come back and see it, you have such a fresh perspective on it. It's like mind boggling how human brain works in terms of, of clearing your head and refreshing. Um, I like to think of it as like when you go, if any of you have been uh, buying perfume at any point, you know, before the world fell apart, uh, and you go and you smell all these perfumes, they have those coffee beans. And the reason they have those coffee beans is that that smell will kind of knock out any nuances of vanilla and musk and leather and citrus and begonia that you've been like smelling and absorbing. Um, so your all of your senses reach a point where they get saturated and your eyeballs are no different. Um, I think, what is that, Stendhal syndrome? It's not really quite that, but maybe it's that on like a tiny little uh, microcosmic level when you're doing a drawing. So it's just really important to walk away. Um, and I know that that can be really hard to do. Like I'm a very type A person. And if I'm in the middle of something, I don't want to walk away. I feel like I'm going to break my concentration, that I'm just going to ruin everything. But a lot of times it is the freshest and most wonderful way to gain perspective um, on your work. And, and maybe, maybe there's a life lesson in there too, that you should just, <laughs> just walk away when it feels overwhelming and come back and you'll probably feel better. <laughs> if you're not going to um, tone the whole paper, do you ever use just a, a mid-tone paper and then use a white chalk? Your Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really, really nice way to shortcut in a way. Um, you can buy like butcher paper, you can buy gray paper, there's like beige and, and light browns and things like that. B slightly blue ones are kind of interesting. And then what you do is you get white Conte, which is like a white charcoal um, that's compressed or a white charcoal pencil like this and then you can go in and create your highlights instead of erasing um, you're still going to erase to get different nuances of mid-tone and darker areas and lighter areas but it's you just basically balance it with like your charcoal and your white charcoal and so you're using black and white on essentially a mid-tone um, and that's a nice way to to get a really beautiful effective drawing like for instance when I go to um when I go to life drawing sessions or when I'm drawing like a human figure, it can make the most beautiful difference when you work on like beige or like like kind of a raw sienna or burnt sienna kind of colored paper. Uh, people's features just just jump forward. Like it's just so vibrant. It's sort of like the, the Pygmalion and Galatea thing where you're just like already breathing life into the marble just by having that warm tone. Um, so that is that is a really cool thing to do. And now I'm like, a little bit mad that you said that because I'm like maybe I should have done that. No, I'm sorry. I just I, I'm thinking because you went through all that work to do the midtown. Yeah, I'm always yeah. I'm always looking for shortcuts. Sorry. <laughs> no, absolutely. That's it's a great way to go. And like honestly, you can just buy a roll of butcher paper. Um, I don't know how archival butcher paper is, so I can't speak to that. But uh, but it is a really great way to study and get a bunch of um, get a bunch of little test drawings or sketches or whatever. Uh, and actually to speak to archival paper for just a quick moment, um, whenever you're doing any sort of drawing that you feel like you may want to keep um, for posterity and just have in general and that you that will last, make sure that you are spending the time and money to buy acid-free archival paper. And it's usually written right on top of the, the paper that you buy. It'll say it on the cover of the sketchbook. It'll say acid-free. Or if you're buying individual sheets, odds are individual sheets are generally acid-free because they're like one to five dollars a sheet. But the idea is that like if you've ever seen an old newspaper that's turned yellow, um, if there is any sort of acidity in the paper, it will eventually over time turn yellow and crumble and you won't be able to keep your beautiful drawings. Um, that said, we now live in the digital age. You could take a picture, but I think bit rot is also still a thing. So I think nothing is permanent. So just subscribe to the Buddhist tenet that no matter what you work on, it's all going to crumble at some point. Um, but if you want it to, to last within your lifetime and be good enough to show in a in a gallery or something like that, that kind of setting, just just invest the money into just getting something archival. Um, and for that matter, honestly, like I, I have a very contentious relationship with like the amount of money that I spend on my art supplies. But I will say that in general, the, the rule of thumb is that if it costs a little more, it's generally a little better. So when you're learning, it's totally fine to go to like a Michaels and pack of tans and get like kind of go into like their art section and just buy like cheap materials. Um, 
totally fine. But after a certain point, once you're, you've built up your hand and, you, and you're more serious about your work, it definitely pays to invest. Um, it's like, I'm, I just keep going back to like references of going to a department store, but it's like buying night cream. Um, ladies, am I right? It's like $120 or something for a little jar. And you're like, why am I spending all this money? But then six months have passed and you still have cream in there. Um, it's like that, like longer, like better, better quality art materials are gonna last you a lot longer, especially when you get into things like color, paint, pigments, etc. cetera. Um, but I should be drawing and, ta and talking at the same time. Sorry guys. Um, so with these kind of lit situations where uh, it's more of a, um, oh God, what is it called? Specular, specular light? No, direct lighting situation. Um, you're gonna get these really cool, interesting nuances of shadow on the draping. So again, like I was saying, don't freak out about the fact that, oh my God, I'm drawing draping and I don't know how to draw draping. Just focus on those nuances of light and shadow. Oh, sorry, did that, that sounded like someone might've had a question. No? Okay. All right. Someone just went off mute. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So just continue to look at those nuances of light and shadow as you're working. And hopefully, I didn't even consider this. Hopefully everyone's hard at work at home right now. Continuing to develop their drawings. Um, so yeah, you can treat these little cast shadows in areas of, of lit up parts of drapery as their own little shapes. I'm sitting in this awkward position right now to make sure that you guys can see what you're doing, but generally I would like have my leg uh, propping up my, my easel so that everything's not all wobble jagged, but it is what it is. I will work under any circumstance. Um, so yeah, just continuing to develop that. So right now it's like when I start in these early stages of developing these lights and shadows, yeah, certainly it just looks like an abstract pattern of erase marks and unfinished charcoal. Um, but obviously there's a process. I think that like my generation and younger is used to sort of this idea of looking, of watching like time-lapse videos and saying, oh good, that's how quickly it goes. But really <laughs> it's a very long flow process, which is why everyone sets up uh, time-lapse videos because nobody wants to watch this in real time with zero commentary. Hopefully I am entertaining and charming enough that you guys are enjoying doing this. Um, and hopefully you're all sketching at home. So it's good, you have something to do, but yeah, so just continue and continue to like measure and look at things as they relate to each other in space. So another great way to do that is if you have a pencil in your hand or even just like a little straight edge or a ruler, um, always do this with a completely straight arm. But what you'll do is you'll close one eye and you can line up your pencil uh, to say, let's say I wanna know what the height of this apple versus this apple is, like where does this line fall? versus this line up here. So with a completely straight arm out with a pencil in my hand and one eye shut, I, and you guys won't see this part, but, um, but basically I'll hold my pencil out. And with one eye shut, I just kind of place the pencil along this edge of the apple and this edge of this apple. And that'll give me an angle on my pencil, right? So with a straight arm, if I bring that angle back to my pencil and lay it right on the paper, that gives me the angle. So in this case, I just need to bring this apple up a tiny bit higher. But a lot of times you'll notice that you're like completely off and that really helps. Um, closing one eye in general helps. You then reduce yourself to two dimensions because we have two eyeballs, so we have depth perception. So if you close one eye, you take away your depth perception and then you're just seeing everything as a series of lines and shadows and shapes. Um, and you're not seeing like, oh, this apple's closer, this apple's farther away. So at that point, you can really start to measure, okay, how far out does this apple go? And that really helps with proportion too. Like if I wanna know how big this apple is here, I do the same thing with a straight arm and one eye shut. I hold my hand out straight. I get the angle of the right edge of this apple and the right edge of this apple in real life. Oh, my battery's getting low. Okay. Ah, you guys still there? You see me? Okay. Um, then I bring that pencil this way and I can get the correct angle. So that being said, I do have some troubling news about the fact that my battery is starting to go low. Um, I'm trying to remember where I have a charger in this house. I have one of those wireless chargers on the first floor. So I could ostensibly run down and try to get that. I'm just trying to think. 
I don't like that that's right in the middle. Yeah. What? <laughs> What'd you say? What's Nancy, right in the middle? What'd you say? Sorry, I'm, I'm keep talking over everyone. I'll shut up now. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, but can everybody, I'm still like playing, right? Everybody can still hear me and see me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good, good, good. It was just, I didn't know if my, I had like a weird Zoom thing the other day too, where it was like a misfire. Um, oh, you know what? I have a great idea. I will just log in to my laptop. So if everyone bears with me for like a one minute intermission, I'll just log in on my laptop and then turn off my phone. And that way you guys can still see what's going on. So give me one moment. That'd be fine. Well, she was right about the hot mess part. <laughs> Anybody willing to share? Show what you're, you have so far? I would like to, but I don't know Ooh. how. I, I think if you just face, wait, will this if work? You, if I hold it up? Hold it up close to the camera and just keep talking so ah. that you up. Okay. Oh, there you go. Is okay. That All right, and there's Rita's, yeah? Cool. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> nice. This is what I have so far. Ooh, oh, pretty. Oh, nice. Uh -huh. Wow. I can hold mine up. Gorgeous. Nice. nice. Uh, okay. So now it's just a matter of figuring out how to stay, how to keep this this high. See, we we foolproofed everything except for the actual artist. <laughs> but at any rate, um, here. Actually. All good. So I'll just I'll do this. This is fine. This is like a good bicep exercise for me. So. <laughs> since, since I don't go to the gym anymore, I just I just have a toddler that. I, I hoist around. <laughs> That's probably more work than you ever got at the gym. Oh my God. Um, I, you're totally right because leg day and arm day is every day now. I don't get any less of it. <laughs> I have like, I am one of those people now that like groans when I have to like bend down and I just, I don't know how I got to this point. <laughs> It doesn't get better, Olga. I'm good. No, talk. I know. <laughs> that's that's why there's wine and coffee. Yeah. You have your upper and your downer, and you just work it out. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, just I mean, continue developing and continue working. So, important question: How do I know when I'm done? Um, that is something I cannot teach you. You unfortunately have to take your knocks and um, overdo a work and do it to death and kill it. Uh, you might finish works really early that you look back on six months later and you're like, what the hell was I thinking? There's still all this stuff to do. Um, and I thought I was being minimal, but I was actually being really lazy and undisciplined. Uh, been there, that's me. Um, so it's just something that you learn. Uh, if you can't, if you have trouble gaining perspective on whether you're done or not, it never hurts to ask for a second opinion. Um, you all have this wonderful league and this community of artists, so you can always reach out to one of them. Alternately, you can always reach out to your spouse who doesn't give a good damn about, about work, but <laughs> they have eyeballs and... If you have eyeballs, you can formulate an opinion. Um, that's the same way people say, oh, I don't know, I, like, I can't go to an art museum. I don't know anything about art. And first of all, that's where you start. But second of all, can you look at things? Can you tell me if you like something or not? Then you know about art, like you can talk about art. It's okay, like building up that vocabulary and building up those skills comes later and it can come as slowly or as quickly as you want it to. Um, but it never hurts to just ask somebody in your house. And sometimes it's really, it's, it's sometimes the most bracing advice that you'll get. Like if I ask my boyfriend about something, he's like, that girl looks angry. Is she supposed to be angry? And then I get all mad at him. And then I, I'm like, yeah, she looks kind of angry and I don't want her to be angry. I guess I should fix this. <laughs> like, like you'll get honest advice from people that aren't artists uh, almost, almost more than you might get honest advice from other artists. So if you want to be coddled, talk to an artist. And if you just want the real thing, then just talk <laughs> to a random person in your house. 
Um, ask kids, if you have teenagers or like preteens, man, are they brutal. So just ask them, they'll tell you exactly if you're done with your drawing, if it's worth anything, if it's good. Um, yeah, you just, you learn, you learn how to, that me, it's actually kind of funny because I do these demos so often in my classes and stuff that I always do get about 50% like this. Um, so I, in a way, have sort of lost the ability to finish a drawing <laughs> because I never get the opportunity to do it because you really do need to, I can speak and demonstrate, but when it comes to my own work, I can't sit and talk to somebody the whole time while I'm, while I'm developing like a, a really decent drawing that's worth something. Um, excuse me, apologize a little bit. I drank a lot of tea today and I just feel like it's all just <laughs> coming back up. Um, let's see, there's, I feel like there was something else. I had a list that I wrote out for you guys of things that I wanted to talk, cover. I left the list on the first floor, I'm on the third floor. I'm pretty sure I've covered 95% of what I wanted to bring up. And I feel like there is something missing and I don't wanna log off and then say, oh crap, was that one thing? Um, but that's gonna happen. But yeah, if you guys How have questions, you finish things out, uh, Olga. So, like, when you're done with your uh, with your charcoal drawing, how do you preserve it? What do you spray it with? What do you? Very good question. Yes, excellent question. It's something that I always forget to tell people, so I'm very glad you asked. Um, so there is a thing on the market called spray fixatives, and actually, let me head over to my little handy dandy shelf. That is the upside of working out of my studio. Um, unless I'm not gonna be able to find it. <laughs> so I also have, as you guys can see, I have this shaping hairspray on my shelf because this is also the poor man's fixative. So if you have an aerosol can of hairspray in your house, you do not need to go buy a fixative. Um, it is all a con <laughs> made by big art stores. Uh, no, you can buy fixatives. The, the benefit of fixatives is they are made for what they're doing. And um, you can get them in different finishes, like glossy, satin, matte, just depending on what you like. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you which one to buy because it really is up to your personal aesthetic. But essentially what you do, is you'll open it up, you'll lay your drawing down on the floor in a well-ventilated area. I'm gonna say that again, in a well-ventilated area because nobody needs to be breathing that stuff in. I like to go outside um, on like a porch, uh, lay down a little bit of canvas or rag or cloth or butcher paper or something so that the area around your drawing and underneath your drawing is protected because you don't want to have fixative all over your floor that you have to then mop up. And then going in very slow, pours, like you press down the nozzle and it's a long continuous spray about 12 to 15 inches away from the surface of your drawing. And you're just going to go pretty much, I'm going to show you the pace, but you're generally going to go like this and you're going to go back like this and you're gonna go back like this. You don't wanna move much faster than that. Um, and you're gonna do essentially the way that I, that I tone the paper. So you're gonna go horizontally in like a little tight zigzag, and then you're gonna go vert vertically in a tight zigzag, 12 to 15 inches away from your paper in a well ventilated area. <laughs> Do not do what I do in the dead of winter where I'm like, I'm gonna open a window and do this in my studio. And then I have a migraine for two hours. It's not fun. Um, so just outside somewhere, or if you have like an active fan blowing out. So you'll do that. Also bear in mind that fixative is not a 100% perfect thing. If you did a lot of charcoal layers or you used a lot of loosely packed charcoal like vine or willow in your drawing, you're still going to be able to like put your hand on it and smudge it. The fixative will fix about, I don't know, realistically speaking from experience, 80 to 90% of your surface. You'll let it dry completely. That's the part I forgot. Let it dry completely. Just give it like an hour or something to lay out. You can bring it in once you've, once you've sprayed it, you can bring it into the house. It's going to smell, but it, you won't be like inhaling it that bad. Um, let it dry. And then you want to store it. I would say if you're storing your charcoals in like a flat file, put some wax paper or some butcher paper or newsprint in between, just so like the front of your charcoal drawing doesn't hurt the back of the next drawing you put on top of it. So always have a little layer of protection in there. But ultimately, once you fix it, once you've dried it, all of that, you can then frame it behind glass or plexiglass. You can frame it without that stuff if you want to. I recommend having some kind of a cover. And and then it's and then it's ready to hang in a gallery and you don't have to worry about it so 
Um, but when you're just storing it because Jesus, who has money to frame all their work? <laughs> Am I right? Like that is so expensive. So if you're just storing it in a folio or a flat file or something like that, just make sure you have something in between your, in between your pages. Very good question though. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, what else? What else, you guys? What have you? What did you find uh, the most surprising about what we did tonight? I'm not quite quite as accomplished as you. <laughs> I forgot how long it takes to build up the contrast. Yes, yes, that is that's a it is a slow process. Do you ever um, use gen generals charcoal pencils? Um, I feel like I have, to be completely honest with you, my supplies are like a mix of expensive things that I've bought my, for myself and then things that like my father has handed down to me, things that students have left behind and never claimed. So I'm sure that I have generals in my, in my repertoire. Um, the one that I have right now in front of me that I really, that I've had good success with is this is just Norberg and Linden. It's just like a rando company. I mean, there are certain things like when I talk about buying more expensive supplies, it certainly counts for things like paper. Um, it does count for charcoal a lot of times, but there's other things where like you can, you can skimp. Um, you can have like a pretty cheap dress on and a really expensive bag on your arm and you look like a million bucks, even if the dress only costs you $10. You know, it's like one of those things. You just mix and match <laughs> with certain things. Um, yeah. Okay. So what I was going to ask you, what else, what did you guys find? Um, so I asked surprising. I always like to ask students, what was the most challenging thing about doing this or working in this fashion? I would say for me, it was getting used to the mess because mm. I'm, I'm not a messy person. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was difficult, but I understand <laughs> the, the process, but yeah, that was just me. I, I appreciate that. I do. Yeah, I know. I know it's very hard for some people. Um, yeah, I, I even some days, like, if I want to work on something and I'm like, oh, what medium should I do this image that I have in my mind? I'm like, uh, do I feel like making it a whole thing and getting messy? <laughs> so I, I, I get it. Even as someone who loves messy mediums, I have to be like in the mind frame of it. So I appreciate you going out on a limb and going out of your comfort zone and trying it. So I'm, that's very exciting for me. Even if you decide that you never want to do charcoal again, you can say, I tried it. I know what it's like. I did it. So that's, that's an accomplishment in itself. What's nice is you can cover a large area really quickly to tone it. Whereas if you're just drawing in pencil, it's really a lot more tedious. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Oh, that actually, Kim, that reminds me, you said pencil. Um, a lot of my students will ask me, they'll say, oh, can I go back into this with pencil? You can work with charcoal and pencil simultaneously, but you just have to be very aware of the fact that graphite is shiny and silver and charcoal is usually kind of more matte and black. So if you are okay with those two things competing with each other, um, it takes some practice and it takes some, like, it just takes some trial and error to figure out how to make it work you can make it work when my students just start out in charcoal I always recommend I'm like listen if you want that pencil point use a charcoal pencil because they don't those two mediums do not play well together if you're not prepared for the, the difference between them so in case anyone was wondering about that or decided to venture out and try that at their desk tonight and realize that that it's a little little wonky um, but there can be real beauty in it. I am not opposed to mixing medias. I just always say like proceed with caution and really practice and figure out, figure out what you like and how to do it. Let's see, it's always, I feel like there's always one more thing that I ask my students, but we're not able, it's such a shame. I wish that we were able to have like a proper critique where everybody could like hang up their work. Cause that's, that's what I love the most is listening to students give each other feedback, like in a really cohesive, um, comprehensive Kind of environment but that's that's the bittersweet nature of zoom i'm glad we can meet up at all as opposed to not at all that's it we had uh we were uh, holding our pieces up a little bit uh when you were off looking for your uh laptop yeah but, uh, yeah i saw i saw a couple i saw like the tail end of that which which was cool no and i'm, I'm really glad that you guys have been doing this with me and i hope you got something out of it and um 
I, I'm not, I mean, you know, I'm here to answer questions and all that, but I just did want to thank everyone and thank Deborah and thank Kim for, for the opportunity. Cause this was, oh, this you. was a lot of fun. So I hope, hope you guys had fun too. Yeah. And yes, I would I actually I hope as people continue to develop their, their pieces, if they could send us a, uh, uh, a picture of, of what their, their finished uh, piece looks like, that would be great. You know, we can share that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to see it too. So please, you know, loop me in. I would love that. <laughs> I, I, thought it was, I thought it was great to be reminded um, that it's a drawing. I've been doing a lot of paintings recently and I, I find I, I get sort of lost in rabbit holes about trying to make it so perfect that I'm losing the um, the joy of it being a painting and that that expression of, of the painting, I mean, is translating to drawing as well. But I thought it was really interesting and I really enjoyed it. Oh, yay. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, my pleasure. Yes, I had fun, thank you very much. Good, yay. I'm glad you're not regretting your decision. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Not at all. It's it's so nice because uh, when we can find somebody that that we can do something that's a little more interactive, mm -hmm. we've been trying to 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 mix things up between some some things that we can work along with the artist and then some just uh, artist talks. So yeah. this was wonderful. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. Yeah, that was such a great idea to have everybody get photos and be able to work alongside. So I'm I'm glad. And, and that's what I thought. You know, like it, that this way uh, they can continue with their their pictures. You know, because they have that yeah. reference that you're looking at, and then also the thank you for sending the alternative shots as well. Yeah. Yeah, just so you guys can, and again, you can use like the, all the thumbnail practice still applies to even working from a photograph like that when you have, you know, the next best thing. You can take a, if you're working strictly from a photograph, you can still make the decisions about composition, about cropping. You have less control, but you still have options. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or? Want to show us where where they are with their their picture now? I'll hold mine up. It still needs work, but that's as far as I got. Oh, my. oh so sensitive! I love I love the shine on the fruit. Yeah. Around the sensitive the part is I'm in my family room and I'm afraid to blow the <laughs> dust all over the place. It was a poor poor choice of where I was going to sit tonight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll darken things up and get more detail. I like it. There's Helena. Helena, you push it down a little closer to the camera. Okay. Cool. The thing is, for me, I have never drawn anything in my life. This is how good you are. You did a really nice job. You really <laughs> did. That's so exciting that you've never drawn anything and that's your first one. Oh, I love, I love virgin artists. That's my favorite. <laughs> oh, so exciting. That's that's me. I, 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 I've never taken a drawing class and I am just thrilled to death. I can't, I can't tell you. Really good job. No, that's wonderful. Right. Yay. That's you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. That just made my night. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow, Leo. That's a big one. Oh, wow. Hang on, how do I, how do I yeah. make it big so I can see your specific? Talk, oh, Leah. Wow. <laughs> so you can pin her. Oh, I'm pinning it right, it right now. Off. Yes, okay, leave it up. <gasps> Ooh, very, Um. you know who it's making me think of? Oh my God, who is it making me think of? It's it's reminiscent of an artist. Um. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, not Chagall or maybe Chagall a little bit. No, Chagall's too blurry. No, it's reminding me of somebody. <laughs> When I remember, I will, I will email Deborah and Kim, but it's remind, oh my God, it's gonna be on, it's gonna bother me now. I'm gonna go through all my books when I'm done here. <laughs> How'd you get all that done in an hour, Leah? Wow. Excuse me? How did you get all that done in an hour? Listen, time's money, babe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love you. <laughs> wow. Yes, that's great. All right. Oh, girl, she's got a glass of wine, yeah. too. Leah's my new spirit animal. <laughs> <laughs> There's my little sample of it. Of oh, wow. Well. So, 
Lovely. I'm, I'm working with all vine charcoal, so I'm fighting it, uh, uh, wiping off as quickly as I'm putting it on. So yeah, oh, wow. yeah. You may want to think about because it's really lovely the way it is. So I don't want to. I don't want you to like kill it too much, but you may want to think about getting a charcoal pencil and doing just some lovely fine lines. Oh yeah, I have them here. It's just <laughs> cool. I with all the vines. And I'm I'm kind of where Kim is right now because I dropped a small piece of vine charcoal <laughs> and, and now I'm afraid to move until I find it. <laughs> so. Yep. It's like when my toddler drops a blueberry on the rug, I'm like, nobody move. <laughs> nobody go anywhere. That's it. <laughs> oh lord so many blueberries on my feet <laughs> oh, that was really good thank you Olga oh thank you and I also just saw Lance's little note about the 12 hour hold in the chat and I that was that made me laugh a lot because because you're right you do get to it's a very ambivalent relationship that an artist has with their work it's like oh oh do I actually like this oh it's going so well oh no I effed it up it's totally ruined I'm gonna put it away for six months and then you oh, like pull it back out in six months and you're like I love it and then two years pass and you're like this is terrible what was I thinking why did I love this so it's just it goes back and forth um it's a very, it's like a teenage relationship and that's okay. Just lean into it. It's fine. It'll pass. Everything will be okay. Um, you won't, you won't hate it forever. I promise. But you also won't love it forever necessarily. <laughs> Can you show it's us yours again, Olga? Mine? Yeah, sure. Sure. It's, uh, you know, definitely a work in progress, but there it is. I always, you know, in a way it's like, I, I love teaching. I know that I can like effectively take people through doing a drawing, but I'm always a little bit embarrassed because I know that like my demo is never as good as if I was just sitting and focusing like like all of you guys get to do. Um, so it's always, like I said, it's always like this half finished thing that I'm like, okay, and we're done. Next class, next demo. Um, so maybe, maybe one day whenever, whenever I have unlimited time for a week straight, I'll just pull every demo out and just finish them. <laughs> it is interesting to 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 figure out because i know you said it's always hard to tell when when you're finished with mm -hmm. them but so like if you would if you look at what you have there like mm -hmm. how much longer do you think you would work on something like what i you know, yeah i think that, that i would like i'm really happy with the relationship of the central apple to the vase um and i like the contrast there so i think what i would do um and normally i like to get a little distance from it to like distance in terms of time um before i make any further assumptions or decisions but i think what i would do is i would sink this background further um and i would develop these foreground apples a little more and so then i would make the focus be this kind of this triangle of apples and then leading vertically upward with the uh the white base so yeah i would just kind of like i would sink through i would do kind of like a chiaroscuro kind of like very dark caravaggio-esque sort of where everything else would go into the background and then i would spend time really developing the three apples in the foreground so that's that's just my my first impression like if I was in a class and I was working on that that's what I would do mm -hmm. depending on the piece do you decide if you're going to try to sharpen up lines or or blur them out or yeah 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 and I think that that goes into the selective emphasis thing that we were talking about where I sort of decide like what's what's the most important thing for my viewer what do I sharp relief as it were whether metaphorically or or um visually uh so yeah i mean i think i think that what i just said with the three three apples that kind of relationship where the viewer i would kind of ping pong around ping pong around and come up on the vase um that that to me seems like the most important situation um and were i to do it again i would probably shift my whole kind of composition the other way so kind of what you guys saw when i was doing those thumbnails was like my struggle in real time because sometimes you do three thumbnails and you're like cool nailed it got it i know which one i want i know my composition and other times you do what i do like you do three thumbnails and you're like this is still garbage i hate this composition but for the sake of time so you guys don't sit and watch me slave over my perfect composition i just moved on um, but yeah, I would, I think maybe going back to it cause I, I'm not unhappy with this composition. Like I could just leave this up and do a drawing on my own or a painting even, but I would probably shift this over this way. Um, and then have like the hand more here and then really show that relationship of this sort of like parade of apples coming into the foreground. 
So that's, that's me. Cause I'm always finding, <laughs> always like doing it, happy with it. And then immediately after going, Oh crap, I should have done it the other way. So, <laughs> so that's, that's a constant, constant struggle in my professional work. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you so much. If if nobody has any other questions, I think we're uh, we'll, we'll we're okay to to end the demo. If you are Olga, I mean, yeah, absolutely. And again, thank you guys so much for your time. Um, and good job, good progress to those of you who shared. And I'm sure the rest of you had good progress, even if you were too shy to show it. Um, in in my classroom, in real life, you couldn't hide from me. I would just walk around and look at everyone. But in any case, um, yeah, I hope you guys all got something out of this. And thank you for your time. And I really appreciate the opportunity. And um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go see what my toddler is doing downstairs. So okay, well, wonderful. Thank you. And everybody, uh, if you want to keep developing your picture uh, for that Wednesday, October 28th, our show and share. You could uh, this could be part of the thing that we can uh, you know. Uh, put up and discuss and uh, anything else that you get a chance to work on this month, including the, uh, the challenge, you know, we would love to see those pieces as well. But thank you so much to everybody for attending tonight. It was great seeing y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,